Chapter Six of A Small Boy and Others. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by M. B. A Small Boy and Others by Henry James. Chapter Six. I see a small and compact and ingenuous society screened in somehow conveniently from north and west but open wide to the east and comparatively to the south and though perpetually moving up broadway none the less constantly and delightfully walking down it broadway was the feature and the artery the joy and the adventure of one's childhood and it stretched and prodigiously from union square to barnum's great american museum by the city hall or only went further on the saturday mornings absurdly and deplorably frequent alas when we were swept off by a loving aunt our mother's only sister then much domesticated with us and to whom the ruthless care had assigned itself from the first to wall street and the torture chamber of dr parkhurst our tremendously respectable dentist who was so old and so empurpled and so polite in his stock and dress coat and dark and glossy wig that he had been our mother's and our aunt's haunting fear in their youth as well since in their quiet warren street not far off they were dreadful to think comparatively under his thumb he extremely resembles to my mind's eye certain figures in fizz's illustrations to dickens and it was clear to us through our long ordeal that our elders must by some mistaken law of compensation some refinement of the vindictive be making us pay for what they in like helplessness had suffered from him as if we had done them any harm our analysis was muddled yet in a manner relieving and for us too there were compensations which we grudged indeed to allow but which i could easily even if shyly have named one of these was godey's lady's book a sallow pile of which it shows to me for sallow in the warmer and less stony light of the wall street of those days and through the smell of ancient anodynes lay on joey bagstock's table for our beguilement while we waited i was to encounter in fizz's dombey and son that design for our tormentor's type there is no doubt whatever that i succumbed to the spell of Godey, who unlike the present essences was an anodyne before the fact as well as after since i remember poring in his pages over tales of fashionable life in philadelphia while awaiting my turn in the chair not less than doing so when my turn was over and to the music of my brother's groans this must have been at the hours when we were left discreetly to our own fortitude through our aunts availing herself of the relative proximity to go and shop at stewart's and then come back for us the lady's great shop vast marmorian plate glassy and notoriously fatal to the female nerve we ourselves had wearily trailed through it hanging on the skirts very literally of indecision which bravely waylaid custom on the broadway corner of chambers street wasn't part of the charm of life since i assume there was such a charm in its being then i allude to life itself so much more downtowny on the supposition at least that our young gravitation in that sense for most of the larger joys consorted with something of the general habit the joy that had to be fished out like truth from the very bottom of the well was attendance at trinity church still in that age supereminent pointedly absolute the finest feature of the southward scene to the privilege of which the elder albany cousins were apt to be treated when they came to stay with us an indulgence making their enjoyment of our city as downtowny as possible too for i seem otherwise to see them but as returning with the familiar stuart headache from the prolonged strain of selection the great reward dispensed to us for our sessions in the house of pain as to which it became our subsequent theory that we had been regularly dragged there on alternate saturdays was our being carried on the return to the house of delight 
or to one of them, for there were specifically two, where we partook of ice-cream, deemed sovereign for sore mouths, deemed sovereign, in fact, all through our infancy, for everything. Two great establishments for the service of it graced the prospect, one Thompson's, and the other Taylor's. The former, I perfectly recall, grave and immemorial, the latter upstart but dazzling, and having together the effect that whichever we went to we wondered if we hadn't better have gone to the other, with that capacity of childhood for making the most of its adventures after a fashion that may look so like making the least. It is in our father's company, indeed, that, as I press the responsive spring, I see the bedizened saucers heaped up for our fond consumption. They bore the tailor title, painted in blue and gilded, with the Christian name, as parentally pointed out to us, perverted to J-H-O-N for John, whereas the Thompson name scorned such vulgar and, above all, such misspelt appeals. Whence I infer that still other occasions for that experience waited on us, as almost any would serve, and a paternal presence so associated with them was not in the least conceivable in the Wall Street repair. The presence is, in fact, not associated for me to any effect of directness with the least of our suffered shocks or penalties, though partly doubtless because our acquaintance with such was of the most limited. A conclusion I form even while judging it to have been on the whole sufficient for our virtue. This sounds, perhaps, as if we had borne ourselves as prodigies or prigs, which was as far as possible from being the case. We were bred in horror of conscious propriety, of what my father was fond of calling flagrant morality. What I myself at any rate read back into our rare educational ease, for the memory of some sides of which I was ever to be thankful, is, besides the general humanization of our apprehended world and our social tone, the unmistakable appearance that my father was again and again accompanied in public by his small second son. So many impressions come back to me as gathered at his side and in his personal haunts. Not that he mustn't have offered his firstborn at least equal opportunities, but I make out that he seldom let us forth, such as we were, together, and my brother must have had in his turn many a mild adventure of which the secret, I like to put it so, perished with him. He was to remember, as I perceived later on, many things that I didn't, impressions I sometimes wished as with a retracing jealousy, or at least envy, that I might also have fallen direct heir to. But he professed amazement, and even occasionally impatience, at my reach of reminiscence, liking as he did to brush away old moral scraps in favour of new, rather than to hoard and so complacently exhibit them. If in my way I collected the new as well, I yet cherished the old. The rag-bag of memory hung on its nail in my closet, though I learnt with time to control the habit of bringing it forth. And I say that with a due sense of my doubtless now appearing to empty it into these pages. I keep picking out at hazard those passages of our earliest age that help to reconstruct for me, even by tiny touches, the experience of our parents, any shade of which seems somehow to signify. I cherish, to the extent of here reproducing, an old daguerreotype, all the circumstances of the taking of which I intensely recall, though as I was lately turned twelve when I figured for it, the feat of memory is perhaps not remarkable. It documents for me in so welcome and so definite a manner my father's cultivation of my company. It documents at the same time the absurdest little legend of my small boyhood the romantic tradition of the value of being taken up from wherever we were staying to the queer, empty, dusty, smelly New York of midsummer. I apply that last term because we always arrived by boat, and I have still in my nostril the sense of the abord of the hot town, the rank and rubbishy waterside quarters where big loose cobbles, for the least of all the base items, lay wrenched from their sockets of pungent black mud, 
and where the dependent streets managed by a law of their own to be all corners and the corners to be all groceries groceries indeed largely of the green order so far as greenness could persist in the torrid air and that bristled in glorious defiance of traffic with the overflow of their wares and implements carts and barrows and boxes and baskets sprawling or stacked familiarly elbowed in its course the bumping hack the comprehensive carriage of other days the only vehicle of hire then known to us while the situation was accepted by the loose citizen in the garb of a freeman save for the brass star in his breast and the new york garb of the period was as i remember it an immense attestation of liberty why the throb of romance should have beat time for me to such visions i can scarce explain or can explain only by the fact that the squalor was a squalor wonderfully mixed and seasoned and that i should wrong the whole impression if i didn't figure it first and foremost as that of some vast succulent cornucopia what did the stacked boxes and baskets of our youth represent but the boundless fruitage of that more bucolic age of the american world and what was after all of so strong an assault as the rankness of such a harvest where is that fruitage now where in particular are the peaches d'antan where the mounds of isabella grapes and seckle pears in the sticky sweetness of which our childhood seems to have been steeped it was surely save perhaps for oranges a more informally and familiarly fruit-eating time and bushels of peaches in particular peaches big and peaches small peaches white and peaches yellow played a part in life from which they have somehow been deposed every garden almost every bush and the very boys pockets grew them they were cut up and eaten with cream at every meal domestically brandied they figured the rest of the year scarce less freely if they were rather a party dish it was because they made the party whenever they appeared and when ice cream was added or they were added to it they formed the highest revel we knew above all the public heaps of them the high-piled receptacles at every turn touched the street as with a sort of southern plenty the note of rejected and scattered fragments the memory of the slippery skins and rinds and kernels with which the old dislocated flags were bestrown is itself endeared to me and contributes a further pictorial grace we ate everything in those days by the bushel and the barrel as from stores that were infinite we handled watermelons as freely as coconuts and the amount of stomach ache involved was negligible in the general eden-like consciousness the glow of this consciousness even in so small an organism was part of the charm of these retreats offered me cityward upon our base of provisions a part of the rest of which i disengage was in my fond perception of that almost eccentrically home-loving habit in my father which furnished us with half the household humour of our childhood besides furnishing him with any quantity of extravagant picture of his so prompt pangs of anguish in absence for celebration of his precipitate returns it was traditional for us later on and especially on the european scene that for him to leave us in pursuit of some advantage or convenience some improvement of our condition some enlargement of our view was for him breathlessly to reappear after the shortest possible interval with no account at all to give of the benefit aimed at but instead of this a moving representation a far richer recital of his spiritual adventures at the horrid inhuman inns and amid the hard alien races which had stayed his advance he reacted he rebounded in favour of his fireside from whatever brief explorations or curiosities these passionate spontaneities were the pulse of his life and quite some of the principal events of ours and as he was nothing if not expressive whatever happened to him for inward intensity happened abundantly to us for pity and terror as it were as well as for an ease and equality of amusement among ourselves that was really always to fail us among others comparatively late in life after his death i had occasion to visit in lieu of my brother then in europe 
an American city in which he had had, since his own father's death, interests that were of importance to us all. On my asking the agent in charge when the owner had last taken personal cognizance of his property, that gentleman replied, only half to my surprise, that he had never in all his years of possession performed such an act. Then it was, perhaps, that I took the most measure of his fine faith in human confidence as an administrative function. He had to have a relation, somehow expressed, and as he was the vividest and happiest of letter-writers it rarely failed of coming, but once it was established it served him in every case much better than fussy challenges, which had always the drawback of involving lapses and inattentions in regard to solicitudes more pressing. He incurably took for granted, incurably because whenever he did so the process succeeded, with which association, however, I perhaps overdrench my complacent vision of our summer snatches at town. Through a grave accident in early life, country walks on rough roads were, in spite of his great constitutional soundness, tedious and charmless to him. He liked, on the other hand, the peopled pavement, the thought of which made him restless when away. Hence the fidelities and sociabilities, however superficial, that he could not reaffirm. If he could only reaffirm the others, the really intimate and still more communicable, soon enough afterwards. It was these of the improvised and casual sort that I shared with him thus indelibly. For truly, if we took the boat to town to do things, I did them quite as much as he, and so that a little boy could scarce have done them more. My part may indeed but have been to surround his part with a thick imaginative aura, but that constituted for me an activity than which I could dream of none braver or wilder. We went to the office of the New York Tribune. My father's relations with that journal were actual and close and that was a wonderful world indeed, with strange steepnesses and machineries and noises and hurrying, bare-armed, bright-eyed men, and amid the agitation clever, easy, kindly, jocular, partly underdressed gentlemen, it was always July or August, some of whom I knew at home, taking it all as if it were the most natural place in the world. It was big to me, big to me with the breath of great vague connections, and I supposed the gentlemen very old, though since aware that they must have been, for their connections, remarkably young, and the conversation of one of them, the one I oftenest saw uptown, who attained to great local and to considerable national eminence afterwards, and who talked often and thrillingly about the theatres, I retain as many bright fragments of as if I had been another little Boswell. It was as if he had dropped into my mind the germ of certain interests that were long afterwards to flower, as, for instance, on his announcing the receipt from Paris of news of the appearance at the Théâtre Français of an actress, Madame Judith, who was formidably to compete with her co-religionary, Rachel, and to endanger that artist's laurels. Why should Madame Judith's name have stuck to me through all the years, since I was never to see her, and she is as forgotten as Rochelle is remembered? Why should that scrap of gossip have made a date for my consciousness, turning it to the comedy with such an intensity that was long afterwards to culminate? Why was it equally to abide for me that the same gentleman had on one of these occasions mentioned his having just come back from a wonderful city of the West, Chicago, which, though but a year or two old, with plank sidewalks when there were any, and holes and humps where there were none, and shanties where there were not big blocks, and everything where there had yesterday been nothing, had already developed a huge energy and curiosity, and also an appetite for lectures. I became aware of the comedy, I became aware of Chicago. I also became aware that even the most alluring fiction was not always for little boys to read. It was mentioned at the Tribune office that one of its reporters, Mr. Solon Robinson, had put forth a novel rather oddly entitled Hot Corn, and more or less having for its subject the career of a little girl who hawked that familiar American luxury in the streets. 
The volume, I think, was put into my father's hand, and I recall my prompt desire to make acquaintance with it no less than the remark, as promptly addressed to my companion, that the work, however engaging, was not one that should be left accessible to an innocent child. The pang occasioned by this warning has scarcely yet died out for me, nor my sense of my first wonder at the discrimination. So great became from that moment the mystery of the tabooed book of whatever identity. The question in my breast of why, if it was to be so right for others, it was only to be wrong for me. I remember the soreness of the thought that it was I, rather, who was wrong for the book, which was somehow humiliating. In that amount of discredit one couldn't but be involved. Neither then nor afterwards was the secret of hot corn revealed to me, and the sense of privation was to be more prolonged, I fear, than the vogue of the tale, which even as a success of scandal couldn't have been great. End of chapter 6